a graduate student from the University of Delaware. Uh, I'm working on a code called MRAM, uh, and we're working on porting it to GPUs, and we're using OpenACC to do that. Uh, so just shouting out the group that's collaborating on this. So there's me, there's my advisor, uh, Sunita Chandra Sekharan from University of Delaware, and from NCAR we have Shaquan Su, Sina Miller, Supreet Suresh, Matthias Rempel, and Rich Loft. And then from Max Planck, we have Damien Shubilski. He told me how to pronounce it, but it's Polish, so it's hard. Um, so this kind of outlined the talk. I'm first gonna talk about kind of what MIRAM is and what its goals are. Um, I'm gonna talk about what OpenACC is and how we're using it. I'm gonna talk about the different tools we're using to make programming in OpenACC for us manageable. And we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about roadblocks that we encountered and how we overcame them with our tools and then some results. The project isn't done, but we do have some results that are starting to look nice, so I just wanted to flip through them really quickly. Okay, so starting off with MIRAM. MIRAM is a solar model and used for simulations of different layers of the sun's atmosphere. Um, not exactly, I'm not exactly on the science side as much as I am on the programming side. Uh, so I'm just gonna quickly go over it. Okay, so it was jointly developed by HIO, Max Planck, and Lockheed Martin. So there's a few reasons why we want to port MURAM over to GPUs. <coughs> One of them is the DKIS telescope. That's a $300 million NSF investment that after it's finished, we're expecting to receive unprecedented solar observations. And with those new observations, we're expecting MURAM to need about 10 to 100 times increase in computation power to be able to handle uh, this new telescope, essentially. Um, so, on the, I'll start with the right side because the video started playing on its own. This is a simulation of a solar flare. So one of the goals of MIRAM is to be able to simulate these kind of solar phenomena in real time or maybe even uh, faster than real time so we can simulate them and predict them. Um, on the left side, I have some of the different physics that's implemented within MIRAM. So these are all you know, physics routines that we have paralyzed on the GPU. We have some scientific targets and then some things that uh, the science team is working on uh, including into MIRAM for future updates. So that's a little bit about MIRAM, it's a solar code. We're gonna talk about why we're doing it in OpenACC for GPUs. So when we're talking about CPU, GPU, heterogeneous applications, we generally talk about having three options for doing it. One of the ways is just to have libraries. So you have a library, do a specific task, you drop it into your code, you call the library, it gives you the results. Um, that's a good option if there's a library that is already built for the task you're doing. But for us, we are gonna be writing essentially code from scratch. Um, I'm gonna skip the middle one for now and go over to programming languages. So for programming languages, for NVIDIA GPU specifically, which is what we're working on now, we'd be writing in CUDA. There's a few reasons why we don't wanna do that. Specifically, the code is already written in C++. So if we wanted to write it in CUDA, we'd essentially have to write a second version which would require rewriting thousands of lines of code. And not only that, but MIRAM is currently still being used by different users as a CPU application, and some of them won't be using it for the GPU, so it's important that we have a CPU and a GPU version. So that's why we're using OpenACC directives, because with OpenACC, we have a single C++ code, we annotate it with our directives, and then we could build it for different architectures, specifically for the near future we're considering building it for CPUs like it is now and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, and specifically for OpenACC, another reason we're uh, using it is because it has had quite a few breakthroughs in real world science applications. So this is a list of a few of them that are, I guess are more popular. I kind of want to point out one on the right side. This is MPAS Atmosphere. So this is an NCAR code and one of our collaborators, Supreet, will be giving a talk on it tomorrow. So NCAR has already been using OpenACC for some of their other codes, so we decided to use it on this code as well. So I'm gonna go over some of the tools and development practices that we are using for this project for specifically OpenACC. So the first one I wanna talk about is kind of our development cycle. So we have a three-step cycle that we just kind of keep repeating until the code is done. So we have analyze, paralyze, and optimize. So I'm gonna talk about them each one by one real quick. So on the left side, we have a table. The table has the different routines that, uh, that are found within MIRAM and how long they're taking in seconds running on a CPU right now. And they're ordered from most time consuming to least time consuming. 
So when we analyze, we kind of want to look at the code and see how's, how is it performing, which parts of the code are taking the most time, which parts of the code are running less than ideal. And when we do that, we can get an idea of what parts of the code are worth our attention. So in this case, we have them sorted by time consumed or time taken. So maybe we just want to start with the top one because if we parallelize down the GPU, that would most likely give us the most time benefit. After we identify what we want to work on, we go through, we parallelize it, we get it running on the GPU. We don't really care so much about performance yet. We just want to get it working and make sure the output of it is reasonable. And after we have that, we look at it more specifically. We optimize it so it's actually performing kind of well. There's a few different optimizations techniques that we can do. By that point, that's where we're worried about performance. And after we finish that, we go back to analyze. We reanalyze the code, say, OK, now that we made that change, what state is the code in now? What's our next most important thing we need to tackle? And we repeat the cycle. Um, so in order to do our analysis step, one of our main tools we're using is profilers. So for NVIDIA GPUs, we're using a profiler called NVProf. So in NVProf, um, it will give you information about all the events happening on the GPU, and you can kind of navigate it and click on them, and it'll give you really specific details about individual events. So this is a screenshot from an NVProf tutorial, where what they're seeing is they have this blue bar here. That's code being executed on the GPU. So it's essentially work happening on the GPU. And when they click on it, it gives them some feedback. So here it's saying that that bit of GPU code is being limited by memory bandwidth. So there's too much memory usage going on and not enough computation. And that's its main limiting factor. So you can use NVProf to look at our GPU code and say, what can we do to make our GPU code run better? And an extension on NVProf is the CoopT CUDA Profiling Tools Interface uh, Library. This lets us put annotations into our code so that when we run it through a, a profiler, it will show additional information. So specifically, this is a screenshot from a few months back when we we're still like getting everything over to the GPU. And what we ended up using this library for is we were profiling our GPU code um, and we're seeing like significant gaps in our GPU execution. So our GPU was not being active for the entire time. It would have periods where it was just sitting, sitting idle. And we wanted to understand what was happening in those periods a little better. So we use the CUPT library to annotate CPU regions. So we can kind of see, OK, here was a gap in our GPU usage. And in the middle of that gap is this little block of CPU usage. So we can start to look at, OK, what's actually happening during those gaps? And what can we do to start getting the GPU more active? Uh, next tool is the CUDA occupancy calculator. So this measures GPU occupancy. And GPU occupancy generally means uh, how many or what percentage of the GPU cores are active at a given time. So when you're kind of programming for a GPU, the ideal situation is 100% of the cores are active 100% of the time. That's always the, the goal at least. Um, and we can use the, the calculator here to give us an idea of, theoretically speaking, what is going to be our max occup uh, occupancy. So this is a graph that the calculator generated for us for our code. And on the x-axis, this is uh, GPU resource usage per core. And on the y-axis is uh, number of CPU cores that can be active simultaneously. So essentially what this graph is telling us is that the amount of uh, GPU resources per core is too high. The GPU is running out of resources and thus can't maintain 100% utilization. So we'd have to work through the code, optimize it in a way where we're using less resources. And this will be a little bit important in the next section, so I'll leave it there. And the last tool, this is the newest one. This is specific to the PGI compiler, which is the OpenACC compiler that we're using. This is the PCAST feature, or the PGI compiler assisted software testing. And this lets us do automated testing for when we run our code. So essentially how this tool works is when we move something over to the GPU. So we had our C++ code, we're putting in open ACC directives, we're annotating it, and when we compile it, we run it on a GPU. And what PCAST lets us do is when we run our code, it will run the CPU run next to a GPU run of the same chunk of code side by side, and it'll do a direct comparison immediately of their output. So in the little example at the bottom here, you can see that this, uh, this left value here, this is what the CPU calculated from running, 8.4 something, something, something. And this value here is what the GPU calculated, so 1.0 something, something, something. Then you can give it a tolerance for accuracy. 
And you can see right away, okay, my, my CPU is supposed to be 8.4 something, my GPU, supposed, my GPU is seeing 1.0 something, obviously my GPU is doing something very wrong that's giving me a very wrong answer. So it's, this tool is really useful where we can make a small change to the code, run the code, and see immediately if something we did just broke it. <coughs> So I want to move on to the roadblocks that we faced, and I'm kind of going to introduce just two major roadblocks and how our tools helped us work through them. They're not the only roadblocks that we face, but I think they're like the more unique ones. So when we're using the occupancy calculator, we were looking at like the routines individually and seeing what the or what the calculator was saying was their theoretical max versus what the profiler was saying is what they actually achieved. So we saw two major things from this. I'm gonna go through them one by one. So the top bit here is some of our, our individual physics routines. And then the bottom portion here is specifically uh, radiation transport routines. So both of them kind of have two separate problems. So I'll go one by one. So starting up here, I'm gonna use our MHD uh, routine as an example. When we compiled it, based on the uh, GPU resources it was compiled to use, it was telling us that we would only max out at 25% GPU occupancy, meaning we only get about 25% of our max theoretical performance out of the GPU. And when we ran it and ran it with a profiler, we're seeing that yes, when we actually ran it, we only achieved about 25% of our total occupancy. So that's kind of a problem where we would optimize the code and tweak it a little bit to try to use less resources and work through it that way. It's a little bit more open-ended and more about just optimizing specific pieces of code. And then the second problem we're seeing is in the radiation transport. Um, so radiation transport's made up of a few individual kernels. I'm gonna look at the driver one because that's kind of the main uh, time intensive loop. So driver is saying that theoretically speaking, the calculator is saying that we should be using 100% of our GPU, but when we actually run it, we're only getting about 10%. So really, we're only see really it's kind of a problem of, okay, why is this discrepancy here? And we uh, dove into what we can do to make it better. So for the next little bit, I'm gonna be talking about radiation transport and why this is performing so badly. So radiation transport uh, kind of has a well-known dependency associated with it, so well-known data dependency. So I'm gonna go through this, this 3D diagram here. So this is marking out 3D points in space. And what we're trying to compute in this small example is we're trying to interpolate intensity from E along to F, so from point E along to point F. But in order to calculate that, we had to have already pre-computed points A, B, C, and D. So that's kind of where the dependency comes from. We can't compute E to F until we've already computed A, B, C, and D. Um, from a coding standpoint, you can kind of break it up into this colorful Rubik's Cube. So essentially what we're seeing is when we're trying to compute that, when we're trying to compute that intensity, uh, we can take our 3D cube and break it into two-dimensional slices. So, and each two-dimensional slice has to be independent from each other, but the points within that two-dimensional slice can be paralyzed. So essentially what would happen is the outer, like, tannish color is our boundaries, and those don't change during computation. And then we would first calculate this red, this red plane, followed by the blue plane, followed by the green plane. The green plane you can see a little better because it's, it's at the front of the cube. So essentially, in order to, be able to, in order to be able to paralyze radiation transport, we kind of have to obey this dependency, which means that we can only paralyze two dimensions of our problem at a time, which is significantly worse than the other routines which we, which we were able to paralyze across three dimensions. And using more profiling stuff, this is to further show the problem that we're seeing with radiation transport. So these two little bits here, that is us computing a slice on the GPU, so that's where actual computation is running. And the bits up top, that is overhead associated with launching this work onto the GPU. So what we're seeing is that because we're only able to parallelize in two dimensions, we're not giving the GPU enough data, and the time it's spent computing is significantly worse, or significantly shorter than the overhead to even use the GPU. So really the main problem we're seeing with radiation transport is just that because we're, pro we're accounting for that data dependency, we really can't get the level of parallelism that we want. And there's a few things we're trying. I'm not gonna go into them because I don't really have time to in this talk, 
But there's a few things that we're trying to do to essentially get more data computed at a single time so that these kernels would be bigger and the overhead would matter less and hopefully your occupancy would go up. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about is our results. So the project is still ongoing. Um, so I'm gonna show some preliminary results. They're not perfect. Actually, I'm gonna, on the first slide, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna point out a problem immediately that we're actually working through now. But we can still go through them. I'm sorry, on the second slide. Uh, this is experimental setup, so this is the machine we're running on. We're running on the Casper system here at NCAR. Uh, it, uh, it's a dual socket Sky, uh, Intel Skylake processor with a total of 36 cores and each node has either four or eight NVIDIA V100 GPUs. So this is a, a table showing the difference in runtime of a single V100 GPU versus a full CPU node on, a, on Casper. And the thing I wanted to point out and a problem that we're currently working through is the, I have speed up on the side here. There's three routines specifically where the speed up looks really bad, that would be Radiation transport, which I'm sure there's more reason than one why that's not performing amazingly. Uh, there's DST and there's DivB. So those three uh, routines, the thing they all have in common is that they're the routines that do all the MPI communication in the code. So one thing that we're really seeing that's weird, for example, DST, for example, is all MPI communication. It does nothing else other than loading buffers and doing an MPI communication. But we're still seeing it take a very significant amount of time. And we think that there's just some weird interaction going on when using MPI for, for GPUs. So I just wanna point that out. That's a problem we know that we're working through. Um, I still wanna show the table to see that even with these known problems, our speed up is starting to get kind of close to the point where it's gonna be a little bit faster than a, a full node of CPU. How many nodes are used? Uh, all these are just single node. We didn't really have time to get all these numbers for multi-node because Casper has been completely smashed, probably for this event. <laughs> Uh, the past week. Um, so this is a scaling plot. So I'm gonna try to walk through it a little bit. The different colors represent some of them. So we have two runs on CPU and two runs on GPU with two different data sizes. Um, okay. So yeah, I'm, this isn't labeled super well, but basically what's happening is we can, I'll look at two lines specifically. So these top two lines here, those are the two larger data set. This is moving, so this is the CPU run, this is the GPU run. So this is moving from four GPUs to eight GPUs, whereas this line here is moving from, I believe it's four nodes worth of CPU cores versus eight nodes of CPU cores. And the chart shows runtime, so lower would be better. So basically we're at a point where it seems like we're scaling at about the same at about the same percentage as our CPU runs. Uh, and for the lower size data sets, we're seeing that we're not really getting max performance out of the GPU, and that's probably just because the data set's too small for eight GPUs. Uh, and then two last quick uh, graphs. This is our strong scaling. So this is just showing GPU results uh, as we increase the number of GPUs. Again, for the smaller data sets, our scaling isn't looking that great, probably because we're really underutilizing the GPUs in terms of data. But for our largest data set, we're seeing almost, we're seeing maybe about a 1.8x speed up when doubling the number of GPUs. And last one is the weak scaling. So this is keeping the number of grid points per GPU constant as we increase the number of GPUs. And we see from two to eight GPUs, we're staying pretty constant, which is good. It means we're not introducing any crazy overhead. However, when we jump from one GPU to two, the main difference between these two plot points is a single GPU doesn't have MPI communication, whereas two GPUs will. So we can see that the overhead for introducing MPI communication is about a second to our average time step time. So that's something that we're also taking the project in the direction of can we, how, how much can we optimize the MPI communication. Um, and I'll leave this slide up, this is the summary, but this is the last slide, uh, so that's it.